And now, welcome to another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole. Here's your host from FederalJack.com. It's Popeye. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another live edition of DTRH. It is November 3rd, 2015. On tonight's live edition, we're going to be covering a very important topic, something that I, I call the bigger picture of what's going on with Westlake. And it encompasses not only Westlake, but something that happened a long time ago as well that's not too far away called Coldwater Creek. And I'm going to be discussing both of those issues tonight. And I would be remiss in my duties discussing Coldwater Creek if I actually didn't have on the guest that I'm having on tonight. Okay, so I don't want to waste any more time. I want to get right to her because she's waiting very patiently on the line for me. And she's going to teach not only me, but all of you out there as well, about what happened with Coldwater Creek. We're going to take a little bit of a trip back in time, a little history lesson tonight. And we need to do this because it's important and it's connected to what's going on over at Westlake right now. And... Anywhere else that people are affected by nuke waste and radiation. And we're, I'm going to get into all of that tonight, but I don't want to waste any more time. So without further ado, let me bring up my guest, okay? She is one of the founding members of the Cold War, the, and I forget the name of the group. I'm going to have her publish everything, but she's one of the founding members of the activists that are out there putting together the information and getting it out to the public about Coldwater Creek, telling them, what happened to them? I know the, the website's called Cold Water Creek Facts, and that might be the name of their group too, but I don't want to mislabel it. So I'll have her give everything out and plug everything right off the bat in a second. So if you want to keep up with us while we're talking, by the way, go over to Cold Water Creek, coldwatercreekfacts.com, coldwatercreekfacts.com. Go to the website, pull it up, and you'll be able to kind of keep up with her as she's talking. Follow them on uh, Twitter. Follow, I think they have Facebook links up there too. Favorite the page, bookmark it, do whatever you got to do because it's going to be what we're talking about here in the first hour. So let's get right to it. Anyway, my guest tonight is Kim Visentine. She's been at this for quite a long time. She's, I saw her in an article actually titled, if I don't know if I have it open still, uh, I saw her in an article that was sent to me by Radchick, Christina Consolo. Uh, all about Coldwater Creek, and I saw her talking about what she had been through, and um, I wanted to reach out to her and interview her, and very serendipitously, she messaged me today, and she was willing to come on and give me her time very last minute, so I'm just pleased to have her on. Kim, thank you so much, and welcome to Down the Rabbit Hole for the first time, but not the last time. Hi, thank you so much for having me on today. I'm 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 excited to be able to share our story so, with you guys tonight. Before we get into it, because I'm going to give you the floor, I want you to plug everything. Plug your Twitter, your Facebook, the website, and the name of the group, the proper name of the group, because I don't remember it off the top of my head, and I didn't want to give the wrong one out. Um, throw all no that problem. info out, and then we can get into the, you know, the facts about Coldwater Creek. Okay, so our Facebook page is Coldwater Creek, Just the Facts, Please. Um, our website is Coldwater Creek Facts with an S, and our Twitter is CWC Facts as well. Okay. Okay. And that, that's I think perfect. that's it. That's all we have. Okay. Um, so we also have a hashtag Coldwater Creek STL. Okay. And I suggest everybody follow you guys on Twitter. Go to the website again. It's ColdwaterCreeksFacts.com. ColdwaterCreekFacts.com. Again, bookmark it. It's important to understand this stuff. It's important to understand history so it doesn't repeat itself. Because if we do not understand history, it will repeat itself and it will keep happening because we aren't doing anything to change it, to fix it. So that being said, I'm going to give you the floor. Tell the listeners and everybody listening, you have a worldwide listening audience. Go ahead and tell them what the story is of Coldwater Creek. Now, I know it's pretty heinous, but I think it's a little bit more powerful uh, if it comes from you who lived through it, than me. So the floor is yours. Sure. Sure. Okay. So, you know, as you and I were talking earlier, um, as founding members, we never really envisioned ourselves doing what we're doing. You know, we often joke that we are accidental activists, and it is just 
kind of happened to us, um, you know, and I'll, I'll kind of go through the story and explain um, and really have to attribute everything that we've developed to social media. Um, so most of us grew up in a northern suburb in St. Louis. Um, the area was fluorescent. Um, I know you guys have all have heard of Ferguson. Um, it's right in that area with Ferguson, Florissant, um, another little town, sleepy town called Hazelwood. Um, and we lived, I think, what you would consider the quintessential middle class 1950s to 1970s childhood in in this little town in the suburbs. And, you know, as children do, we all grew up. Um, many of us went away to college. We all got jobs. A lot of us moved away after college. You know, and I, I make light of this, but, you know, I always tell people, you know, it's it's normal and healthy for you to move away from your childhood home. You know, really, if you're living in your basement and you're 40, we need to have a different type of intervention. Um, you know, but we all grew up. Um, I currently live in the Detroit area. Um, we all reconnected, um, being neighborhood kids and friends from high school on Facebook in 2011, um, in our 30s and 40s. And what we started noticing is that all of us were sick, and we couldn't figure out why. Um, And just not sick with colds, but sick with, like, crazy cancers and rare diseases. And it it was just, it was really odd, you know. Um, I, I guess I should mention the town we grew up in, um, very patriotic, very defense-laden town. Um, the big manufacturer in the area was Ford Motor Company, and the other one was Boeing. But at the time, it wasn't Boeing. It was McDonnell Douglas. So a lot of our dads grew up as engineers, you know, building F-18s. Um, our moms were housewives. We were living in brand-new subdivisions. Um so we, many of us followed suit and followed in our father's footsteps and became, you know, accountants, engineers, scientists, statisticians, because, you know, you, you, typically people grow up and kind of do what their parents did, right? Um, so as we moved away and we got back together and we started noticing these rare cancers, I have to admit that of our founding group, um, of seven people, we include a mapping specialist who is a PhD at Stanford, um, a economist who teaches at Northwestern and has her PhD from Princeton. I myself hold an engineering degree and a nursing degree. Um, we have a CFO for a Fortune 500 um, pharmaceutical company who's currently on sabbatical raising our children. You know, many professors, teachers, engineers, that was kind of our background. So the numbers spoke to us that something was wrong. Um, And we began to question, this isn't right. How can everybody in our grade school be sick? How can everybody, every girl in this sixth grade class be infertile? The numbers aren't right. Something's not right. And so in 2011, after, you know, reconnecting, we started a Facebook page. And at first it was just 10 of us on this page. And it was, you know, the only connection we could make is that we all grew up around this creek. We had no idea what the contamination in the area was or what was going on. It was really just an inquiry. Hey, are you sick? Did you live in this area? Did you live near the creek? You know, well, the response was overwhelming. People started coming forward. It was neighbors and friends of friends and aunts and uncles and cousins. And we grew organically. Um, It became overwhelming. People were, you know, reaching out to us and and sharing their stories of their illnesses. Um, You know, I myself lost my child to a glioblastoma multiform, which is a grade 4 brain tumor that he was born with. Um, Typically, this brain tumor is seen in 60-year-old men, not babies. Um, it's almost a death sentence. He was given three months to live upon diagnosis. He was two days old. Um, he ended up living six years. 
you know, we're thankful for every moment that we had with him. But, um, you know, it was just, we were told we were one in a million by the doctors. Um, other people in our group have experienced other rare cancers. Um, they were told they were one in a million, and we were just dispersed all across the country, so we had no connection. We had no idea. Um, so as this Facebook page grew and people started reconnecting, um, we started handwriting these diseases and tracking them, you know, as people would comment and put posts. And the first 750 responses from people are, are handwritten in a notebook of, you know, their personal stories of tragedy. Um, we then decided as we grew and our page grew, um, we created a health survey online and had people start filling that out. Um, our page is now over 11,000 people. We're approaching 12,000 of people that grew up in the area. And it's all grown up organically and by word of mouth. But as, you know, in 2011, we started looking into what, what could possibly have caused this. How could we all be so sick? Um, we began just researching documents and news stories, and one of the girls on our page um, found an article talking about the Army Corps of Engineers doing cleanup in the area, unbeknownst to us. Um, they started in 1989. They're there, and they're, I, I would say, they're not hidden, but hidden in plain sight, right? There's a trailer out there. There's a work crew. Nobody pays any attention. It's just a construction crew in a, you know, middle-class neighborhood. You know, for all we knew, they could be building a shopping center. As we looked into the documents, we began to uncover and realize that um, one of the major chemical companies in the area, which is Malincrot, um, many people might know them today as Covidian. Um, they're a major pharmaceutical company. Um, Anybody who's in the medical field would also realize they do supplies, you know, to hospitals as well. Um, but back in the late 1930s, early 1940s, um, Mallinckrodt himself was approached by several colleagues from, that he was friends with from college, um, and those colleagues included Arthur Compton and Albert Einstein. And they approached his company, which was an x-ray company, and asked him to process all of the uranium for the Manhattan Project. Um, it's my understanding, and from the news stories, he turned them down several times. And uh, they were persistent because they knew he had a process in place that could, you know, he was already working with radioactive materials, um, that he could help them refine this uranium. Mallinckrodt ultimately agreed to support them. It was wartime, you know, a wartime effort. We, you know, it was, it was a very patriotic thing, but he had one request, and his request was that if he got involved and, you know, did his civic duty or became a contractor to the government, that he would never be held liable for any of the products that he produced. So years went on, starting in 1942, they began processing all the uranium for the Manhattan Project. All of the uranium that went into the first chain reaction at the University of Chicago was processed in St. Louis and shipped to Chicago, University of Chicago. So we truly are the birthplace of the Manhattan Project in St. Louis um, from a materials perspective. Um, many people are not aware of it because, again, it was wartime, and, you know, this isn't something folks were advertising. They became so good at processing the material and so prolific that they ran out of room at Mallinckrodt Chemical Works, which was in downtown St. Louis, and they began storing the materials off-site in a unpopulated area north of the city. Um, they ended up storing thousands, hundreds of thousands of barrels, industrial barrels of uh, residual uranium byproducts from the processing. And they stored it at the basin of this creek in North County, North St. Louis County. 
um, this creek happens to run 19 linear miles into the confluence of the Missouri River, which dumps into the Mississippi right upstream from Anheuser-Busch um, and where the water intake is for Anheuser-Busch. But it runs 19 linear miles, and it is a 42-square-mile watershed. You know, people are like, that's such a huge watershed, but what folks don't understand is Missouri is kind of known for their caves. I mean, anybody who's read Mark Twain knows that Injun Joe hid in a cave, <laughs> right? Um, and that Anheuser-Busch actually established themselves in St. Louis because they, before re refrigeration, they could store all the beer in the caverns in the city. Um, so the entire area is interconnected underground by rivers and waterways and these caverns. And so by storing this material next to the headwaters of a creek, as it eroded into the creek, it was basically free to move about the cabin, right, in this 42 square miles. Um, you know, years this was this material sat next to the mouth of this creek in these barrels. First they started with barrels, and then they were producing so much that they stopped putting it in barrels, and they were dumping it in dump trucks into the open air next to ball fields in the you know, across the street in northern St. Louis. And that started in 1946. In the mid-50s, there was a huge population boom, and, you know, what typically happens is um, as your population expands, they kind of all move out to the suburbs, right? And everybody wants to buy a new house. This was the 50s. Um, McDonnell Douglas was just coming into their own, building F-18s, so... The area was very, um, it was growing. And, you know, it was an upper middle class neighborhood and there was a lot of industry. And so they took this creek in these, in this undeveloped area and they rerouted the creek to make it more aesthetic and built all these brand new subdivisions, golf courses, you know, shopping malls. And when they did it, you know, who doesn't want a little brook or a creek meandering through their subdivision for their children to play in? As they rerouted this creek that had unknowingly become contaminated with the uranium, they took that sediment that was in the creek and they effectively spread it as fill dirt across all of these subdivisions, um, much like spreading icing on a cake. Um, and then as children, we grew up in these new homes, unknowingly playing in the yards, vegetable gardens were being grown. Um, there were a lot of da dairy farms in the area. Um, I can recall as a child going down to the local dairy that had fresh milk and fresh ice cream from, you know, the farm down the street that was being watered from the creek. Um, what we know today and what we maybe didn't know in the 1950s is that chronic ingestion of this material either directly or indirectly from eating vegetation grown in it or eating um, meats and dairy products that have fed, and livestock that have fed off this contaminated soil and grass will build up in your system over time. Um, and so what we found was, you know, we were ingesting a little over time as children and that builds up in your system and then 20 years later we're all showing up with these erroneous cancers. Um, it's much like lead poisoning or arsenic poisoning where, you know, you can ingest a little bit and it not no, there's no taste, there's no smell, um, there's no odor. You, the products that they have out there are not gamma emitters, so even if you run a radiation detector over the area, you will, um, you'll not track anything. They're alpha and beta particles, which means, you know, externally touching, you're not really at risk, but if you ingest it or inhale it, you run a great risk of, of showing up with these cancers. So as we found this out and we started to realize all these cancers and people were coming forward, 
um, our defense mapping specialist from Stanford, you know, who also happens to be a child of the creek, um, started creating these cancer maps. And if anybody goes to our website, um, Cold Water Creek Facts, they can see these cancer maps that we've been tracking. Um, and what we started doing was bumping up the cancers we have today um, with the Department of um, the Veterans Affairs and with um, radiation exposure victims. And we're showing up with the exact same cancers that they're showing up with. So we began connecting the dots. Um, and over time, we've gone out of our way and we have contacted the Army Corps of Engineers and the CDC and the EPA, and we have been trying to work with them. Um, they are currently cleaning up the area. They've been cleaning up the area for over 30 years now, and they expect to be there well past 2020. So there is an ongoing process to clean it up, but, you know, the damage is done for most of us. We were exposed as children in the 60s and 70s, and, you know, we can't reverse time. We can't go back and change that. So all we can do is, I mean, I hate to say it, sit around and wait and watch our loved ones show up with these cancers. So that's kind of where we're at today. Um, you know, we're living with these cancers today. Um, we're, as a group, like I mentioned, we're over 11,000 members now, and our, our goal is, you know, working with the Army Corps of Engineers, they've really only, they've only, there was so much contamination that they have only managed to clean up the headwaters where the, the waste sat. They are just now, within the past two years, moving upstream of the creek and testing for contamination. And they're finding it not just in the creek, but they're finding it in the neighborhoods because this creek floods like crazy. Um, so they're confirming everything that we have been saying, that this contamination has spread throughout the region. Um, so we're working really, very diligently with the federal agencies so that we can um, have continued funds for cleanup for the region so that it continues to get cleaned up because there are still communities there. There are still people living there, you know. Um, they're not at risk today, but their exposure today could cause harm to them again in 20 years. So who knows, the little girl living in my, you know, childhood home could could be looking at the same fate in her children or in herself when she grows up. Um, so it's very important that we push for continued remediation. Um, the other thing that we're doing is many people are unaware. You know, we were unaware we grew up there. Um, and many of the health officials in the area are completely unaware because, you know, docs, you know, you might go to school in Michigan and end up doing your practice in St. Louis. So they have no idea of the history there. And so our goal is to educate them so that they can understand that we're an at-risk population and, you know, hopefully help us identify these cancers and these illnesses sooner. Um, because early intervention is really, you know, it can mean the difference between life and a terminal diagnosis. You know, and it's it's... I mean, that's kind of where we're at today. So I think that's kind of a summary of where we're at. <laughs> um, we have about, we, uh -huh. have, we only have about 55 seconds uh, before the break comes up. But so what I'll do is I'll hold my questions to the other side. But I have like a, a litany of questions. In fact, you, you have answered one, but I want to get into it a little bit more, uh, that there's actually still um, neighborhoods and homes uh, around Coldwater Creek, and that this contaminated water is flowing up over the banks if it floods, uh, you know, during flood season and sure during rainy season and things like that. So it's just abhorrent that this is still going on, and that they actually still let people live there. Uh, like that's that's the, that's really scary. Anyway, stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen. Three short minutes. We will be right back. Kim Byzantine. ColdwaterCreekFacts.com, ColdwaterCreekFacts.com. Follow them on Twitter, Facebook, go to the website. We will be right back. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. Final segment of tonight's guest, but I still have a second hour here, so don't go anywhere, which I will be getting into Westlake more in depth, and we're actually going to discuss that tonight, Kim and I, before uh, she leaves. But 
I want to get back into our conversation about Cold Creek. And for those of you listening, if you didn't hear the first segment, go back and listen to it in the archives, wherever, YouTube, Truth Frequency, over at PopeyeRadio.com. But make sure you go to her website as well, ColdWaterCreekFacts.com, ColdWaterCreekFacts.com. I'll say it a third time, ColdWaterCreekFacts.com. I'm going to bring back my guest, Kim Visentine. Kim, I have a bunch of questions that I want to ask you. First thing, let's get into these maps. Um, it's actually more, more so of a point than a question. You wanted to bring this up. Um, some of the maps that you've seen shared on Facebook, the pictures of the Coldwater Creek uh, like cancer cluster maps and illness maps, they're, some people are mistaking that, that that's actually currently Westlake. And it's not currently Westlake. It's Coldwater Creek, and like we were saying, uh, it's a good example of what Westlake is going to look like in the future if people stay in that area and they're, they're consistently being irradiated by all this contaminated soil and anything else that's around them. Uh, but uh, I'll give the floor to you, and then um, you can, you can you know, add a few, whatever you want to that. And then I want to ask you a few questions about Coldwater Creek itself and the housing communities, but I know you wanted to, to mention the Coldwater Creek maps. So go ahead. The floor is yours. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. It, you know, it's a very good point. Um, many people ask us and, and, you know, we just kind of want to clarify what the maps are and what they stand for. Um, there's a couple things. So what we found is when we started approaching health officials, um, they told us that there was no cancer cluster. Um, that they had looked at their data and that everything was fine. Um, and we were like, no, it's not fine. Something's, something's seriously wrong because everybody on my street that I grew up with has some type of cancer, and that's not normal, right? And they're like, nope, we looked at the data, we ran our analysis, everything's fine. Well, as we started to educate ourselves on this, we found a couple of things. Um, I talked to before about chronic low-level exposure to ionizing radiation has a latent presentation. That's a whole lot of big words for saying, you know, if you're exposed as a kid, you're not going to show up with cancer right away. It happens over time because it mutates your DNA. So you're exposed as a child or you're exposed as a female because um, radiation is discriminatory. Um, while it does affect men, it does affect women more and children, right, because it's a size thing. Um, so we were exposed, we showed up later with cancers. Well, many of us have moved away. Cancer registries, if you look at them today, they're run by state, they're not run nationally, and they only pick where you live at time of diagnosis. So for example, I grew up my entire life, lived 27 years in the Coldwater Creek area. I moved away. I got a job. Um, I was an engineer before I became a nurse. I worked for Chrysler, and they moved me to Detroit. My son's diagnosis would not show up because he was not diagnosed in the, my hometown. He was not born there. So when researchers look at this, they would never pick up his cancer. Um, the other thing that researchers look at is they look at um, death certificates. And death certificates only tell at least in the state of Missouri, what your primary cause of death was. So my son had cancer, um, but he ultimately died from respiratory failure. His heart and lungs gave out because it was a brain tumor. So on his death certificate, it says Zachary Visentine passed away from respiratory failure, nothing with his cancer. So if I'm a researcher and I look at this, he would never show up from the disease registry, and he would never show up from his death certificate. And we were finding that over and over again, you know, like it's that 40-year-old not living in their parents' basement scenario, right? We all moved away. We moved away from our parents' homes. We live in a transient society today. People don't live in the same hometown they grew up in. You know, they move away. A lot of people, even if you just moved to another city in the same state, you still wouldn't be picked up. So what our cancer maps, what we created this health survey and these cancer maps to show was, did you ever live around Coldwater Creek? And if you ever lived around there and have a cancer, please report. You know, please share with us. And that's what these dots on the map are. And they're overwhelming. We're looking at over 3,500 cancers 
um, we have a really rare cancer, which is appendix cancer. We have 45 of them. And the chances of getting appendix cancer are 1 in 100,000. Um, but many of these people moved away. And so the maps show disease around the creek. There's also a study out there, a zip code study, that shows eight, eight areas that have cancers, and it's put out by the Department of Health. They went back based on our maps and re-looked at their study, and they opened up the time frame so that they could capture some of those people that moved away. Um, and they showed high rates of cancers. But again, those cancers in those eight zip codes are based solely on Coldwater Creek and the Coldwater Creek watershed. Many people are new to the Westlake area and they don't understand that and they hear cancer cluster and they think that it's related to Westlake. And it is, but not in the way they think. Um, what we are is a beacon or a warning for what Westlake can become because we have the exact same cancer, we have the exact same waste. But our disease maps and our cancer cluster does not show contamination around Westlake. Um, the, that report that shows those eight zip codes all eight zip codes fall within the watershed of Coldwater Creek. And so that's the confusion. We are Westlake's future. We are not their current state. And, and you know, I just folks need to understand that. And uh, this sounds horrific, but it could be a very positive thing for Westlake because they're not experiencing the the vast cancers that Coldwater Creek is yet. And so they still have time to make a difference. You know, we are, like I said, we're a beacon. We're a warning sign. We are, you know, Christmas future for them if they don't change their ways. So, you know, that's, it's a very important designation that folks understand that. Those maps, those clusters, those disease rates are all related to the creek. Um, you know, the other thing is, is we can't deviate, and the health officials agree, even some of the cancers that are showing up closer to the Westlake area, did they previously live in Westlake? You know, many of the people and, and some of the founding members of Westlake, you know, are experiencing illnesses, but they grew up as children in Coldwater Creek as well, you know. So again, we're a very strong warning sign for them and, and one that people should heed and pay attention to, you know, and, and realize that there is hope and there is a chance for them to make a difference. You know, we can't change our, our we're on our path for Coldwater Creek. We can't change that. We're all about awareness, you know, but Westlake can learn from us and, and possibly have a more positive outcome. Now, you you were saying earlier that there are still houses along the creek? There's still the communities? Oh, absolutely. It's still communities there. That's horrific. Yeah, people still live there. How is the Army Corps of Engineers not being taken to task by anybody that's still in houses there? Like, well, let me rewind for a second. Did they bulldoze your old community that you grew up in and, and like, fence no, it off? Or is no. it still there? Those houses are still there. Every house is still there. And they're finding it in the parks around the area. And, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers, and we will agree, because it's beta and alpha emitters, it is not for you to walk over the soil won't cause you any harm. But if you garden, if you ingest soil, if you, you know, if you're a kid playing on a playground and you're playing in the dirt, you're ingesting and inhaling, right? Um, and so that is a concern, and they are finding it on the playgrounds. They are finding it around the area. And, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers, again, these engineers, they came in. They didn't understand how much the creek flooded. They didn't understand the change over time of this community until we sat down and explained it to them. And so all we can do is, you know, they're doing a hell of a job with the funding that they have is push for funding because they need to get this area cleaned up and they need to do it fast, you know. And they, they're they held to what Fuse Wrap, which is the formerly utilized sites for the Manhattan Project, uh, designates to them for funds, you know. So the guys that are local to our area are doing what they can with what they're given. So from a big government perspective, you know, we need additional funding. We can't cut this project. We are not the only site in America 
that is, you know, left behind for the Manhattan Project. They're all over the country. You know, and I talked to you about these cancer that they can't determine. I mean, the way that people are today in this transient society, you can't determine a cancer cluster based on the data I shared with you, you know, because people move all over the place. And so the government is operating in a 1950s mode, right? Everybody lives in Mayberry and never moves out of the town, and so we should be able to study that. That's not the way it is today, you know? And, yeah, it, it's a problem. It's a, it's a much bigger problem than people realize. How, how are people – are people notified when they buy these homes that, hey, by the way, the, the ground is – got irradiated soil and that the no they're not and here's the thing the the army corps of engineers did not understand the flooding and until last year they had not tested beyond the floodplain and the way they explained it to us and this makes perfect sense right in a analytical engineering world they cleaned up where those hundreds of thousands of barrels of radioactive material sat first because if you don't clean up the the beginning, it's like a gallon of spilt milk. If you, dr- if you drop a jug of milk on the ground, you don't sop up the milk before you pick the jug up, right? So they had to pick up the jug of milk and, and clean up everything that was eroding into the creek before they could move down or it would just continue to recontaminate over years. So they've spent the last 25 years cleaning up that initial spilt jug of milk. They are just moving on now to clean up the creek, and they're systematically moving up the creek, right, and checking. Well, what happened is they found the contamination based on the maps we shared with them, and they found that it had spread, and so they test up the creek, and as they find it outwards, they then begin to try to bound it, right? So they go move out, and if they don't find the end and they keep finding contamination, they move out farther and farther, and they're finding it in these neighborhoods. And they're only in the first section of the creek. I mean, they're not five miles into this 19-mile creek, you know. So, again, they're going to be here for years to come, you know. And I don't think they really understood the magnitude of it. They are they are realizing it now. And, you know, just within this past year, they're understanding that this contamination is in people's backyards and in these playgrounds that these children have been playing in for now 50 years, this community is, 50 years old. So the realization you know? to the, the people in the area of Coldwater Creek as what's going on with all of that contamination is pretty real to them as well, like or new to them as well? I, I and it's very new and many very new and have. what's happened yeah well what's happening is you know again very typical suburbia you know your parents grow up and your neighborhoods flip over right so you have these neighborhoods that these people bought brand new and they raised their children in and then they retired in and you know these folks are passing away or they're they're moving into retirement communities and they're selling their homes and so you have a new generation moving in right because our us as children we all moved out and bought our own homes in other areas and so you have this new generation and because there's no taste no smell you can't see this stuff the only way you can test it is to actually take these core soil samples and send to a lab for two months to have it decay down right because you can't test it with a, a you know, radiation detector because it's not a gamma emitter. So it takes two months. Well, you know, it's, again, that thing that nobody can see. So because today's community is not sick, you know, they didn't really believe it. Now as these health officials are coming on board and confirming everything we've been saying and, you know, we've been working with them since 2011 and systematically documenting everything, people are starting to realize, aha, they're not crazy. This stuff is real. You know, we've we've always been very careful to base everything on fact, you know. Everything scientifically. We look up and find evidence based journals to back up what we're saying. Um, people are starting to pay attention and they're just really now the community is just now waking up. It's scary. Wow. 
you know. I, I honestly, yeah. I had thought that the area around there, that the government had come in and I was, for some reason, I had thought that they had already gotten at least that area, cl- you know, bought no. off and cleaned you're up. You're talking... Wow. You're talking about a community that's about 200 to 300,000 people living in this area. Wow. And all those people are being yeah. contaminated by, like you said, not only is the soil around there contaminated already, but now every time it rains and if the river floods on a regular basis, you know, depending on whatever the, right. whenever the rainy season. Right. And, you know, the creek, the creek anymore is not so much contaminated because it's a swift moving water source, Right. But it's the sediment. And what happened is, you know, these communities were created in the 50s and 60s. So what they're finding now is over time it's embedded down into the soil so it's six inches deep, right? It's not on the surface anymore. You know, but that still is a concern. There's a big community garden in the area, right? If you're growing vegetation in this and you're consuming it, you know, the one thing health officials can't tell us is, all right, if I am eight months pregnant and I am consuming irradiated vegetables, what does that do to my unborn fetus? If not today, what does that do to this child in 10 years? There is no safe level of radiation. And no. I will repeat that. I again. agree. There is no safe level of radiation. Period. Right. And it's different for everybody, right? Because it becomes an additional risk factor. Your next door neighbor might never show up with signs and symptoms, you know, and then everyone in your family be, might already have a weakened immune system or some other predisposed bio- biological genetic thing going on, and everyone in your can- your family might show up with cancer. There's no way of determining who's going to be affected and who's not, really. Wow. You know? Wow. Just, I, I was, I, and I don't know why. I, I guess I mistakenly see, and I know not to trust the government, but I figured that at least in that that little section where you guys were, that they had, you know, they realized it and they were forced to actually come in there. But I didn't, I didn't think that there was actually that many communities that close. That that's pe- those people need to be aware as to what's going on too. I mean, if that thing's right in their backyard and it's still got sediment in it, right. and the soil that's right at their house, even if even if it's six inches down, I wouldn't be there. Right. I mean, I wouldn't feel right. comfortable living there for real. I myself would not. I wouldn't feel comfortable living anywhere near that whole area now. Not, and I understand I the the monetary value and it's sad and all that. because I have wow. to tell you, it it was a beautiful area to grow up in. Make no doubt about it. Uh, you know, <laughs> literally, you know, backyard barbecues on the weekends, and you know, I I seriously remember my neighbors playing croquet in their backyards. You know, I mean, this is like that 1950s family. I mean, it's funny, but it's not. We were the nuclear families of the 50s. We just didn't realize how nuclear we really were. You know, it, it's it's Scary. so sad because I mean, I saw the pictures in that article, and I can't remember the title of the article now, where I, I, I was already following you on Twitter, but... Is that the Australian news? Yeah, that's the one. It was the Australian the article. Yeah. Yes. Very, yeah. very well done article. And uh, that's yeah. where I, I was like, wow, I need to get her on. And it, I was talking about you last night, actually, um, to Christina, <laughs> uh, a.k.a. Radchick. She's a very good, close personal friend of mine, and we were discussing this whole thing. And she's the one that had sent me the article, and I was like, I need to get Kim on. And then you hit me up today on Facebook, and I was like, see, the universe yeah. wants her on. Uh, this needs to be told. And by the it's way, karma. <laughs> oh, it is. It most certainly is. We were, we were meant to have this conversation, and I want to put this out there for my other fellow radio show hosts and you know the people out there in the alternative media, as it's called. You guys need to reach out. Kim, is there like an email or what's the best way that they can get in touch with you? Because I want the other radio show hosts that are out there, and I'm going to do my part on the back end as well. But you need to reach out to her and have her on, and this needs to be made a priority. And so does Westlake. Both of these issues, yeah. even though they're quote-unquote they're quote unquote two separate issues, they're not really because if you take a step back, it's like looking at one of Rembrandt's paintings. When you look, up at, when you look, them, at, you know, when you look at them up close, they're very uh, detailed they're very amazing, mesmerizing almost, but you only see the minutiae. They're huge. They're like 30 feet, some of them. You have to step back to take the painting in in its fullest to understand it. And 
to understand that both of these situations, even though Westlake and Cold Creek are two separate situations, they're both connected on a much larger scale to many degrees. And everybody in both separate situations is in the same danger. You're both being exposed to radiation, and no radiation right. is good. And everybody, honestly, I believe everybody needs to come together and work together because that's, you guys have the strength. Don't let the nuke industry or the government fool you into thinking that they have the power over it, you and you have to listen to what they say. That is not accurate at all. The power flow actually works quite the opposite. You just have to realize your own true potential. And all of you have that. All of you. You just have to actually realize the power. And the other thing is you have to realize the government isn't really going to tell you the truth. Okay? Right. And I know a lot of people that's hard to accept. But it, it's, you know, look, it was for me. Uh, I, I, used to, yeah. I used to believe and trust the government. I'm former military. I was a firefighter for six yeah. and a half years. And then I was in the United States Coast Guard. Uh, I'm a disabled veteran. I myself had more trust in the government when I was younger. But over the course of time, I've witnessed things on many different levels. Yeah. And it, it's been an eye-opener for me. So I understand how some people could still trust the government, but unfortunately, they're not there for what we think they're there for. Right? Right. And no, I agree. But thank you for your service, for one thing. Um, and, you know, I agree. I, looking back at this, though, you know, not trusting the government, but just understanding the perspective. It's easy to go back and play Monday morning quarterback and say, woulda, coulda, shoulda, right? You know, we were in war at the time. And, I, you know, I have very mixed emotions about this. My father is a Pearl Harbor survivor. He was on a destroyer. He was 17 years old on a destroyer in the harbor when they bombed it. He was on the USS Allen. And so I am not against efforts to end the war, right? I, you know, I, I am a pro-military. I, you know, I'm, I'm very staunchly libertarian. I'm, you know, other than military, I'm not big government. But, but you know, at the end of the day, we can't, we can't go back and change what they did. You know, we can't go back and, you know, say they should have done this. What's done is done, but they can't forget us because we are, we are the victims of World War II, you know, just as much as anybody else, just as much as the Hiroshima bomb victims. We, we are experiencing the same issues from the same war, you know? Agreed. And well said. You guys are still, you're the ongoing victims of World War II. And that should, right. serve, that should serve as an example, Kim, as to how dangerous radiation and this whole nuclear industry that we have and playing with bombs and doing all this garbage that we do. We, we, we shouldn't right. be playing with the elements that are spewing forth in the center of the sun. Let's just, let's just realize that. Maybe we should like, take a step. Right. Back, you know, just, just saying. Pe Pe and they haven't, we are the first nuclear waste. And they still have not cleaned it up. Look at the mess that's in St. Louis. It's not contained. Exactly. And actually, yeah. in hour two, I'm going to get into radioactive waste and the problems with that. We have about two minutes left. Um, I want to give you the floor and let you plug your stuff again. And I want you to give your final thoughts. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Um, you know, again, our Facebook page is Coldwater Creek, just the facts. Um, our website is coldwatercreeksacks.com. Um, we have a Twitter page. It's CWC Facts. And I, I just want to plug, you know, our goals. Our biggest goals are health awareness so that people can get the treatment they need. You know, early intervention can, can save some mother from a terminal diagnosis, and we've seen too much of that. And the other thing we're pushing is we want to be included as a community in the Radiation Compensation Act which is a federal fund that the government already has for Manhattan Project victims. We have been left behind. You know, they did this. They poisoned us, you know, whether it was gross negligence, and you know, intentional, whatever, it's still the government's responsibility. 
you know, and they should come in and help us. And, and this Compensation Act will, it provides some restitution, but it provides grants and funding for the community so that they can get health screening and they can become educated on the system. And really, we're all about helping everyone that's been left behind and been harmed by this. We can't change our exposure, but we can work our hardest to make a difference. I, I wholeheartedly support your efforts. And Kim, thank you very much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. you came on well, last minute. You. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. Uh, it, it's, um, it's been an honor. And my sincerest condolences on the loss of your son through this. I, I, I understand profound loss. So uh, from my you know, the bottom of my heart, my sincerest condolences. And thank you for having the courage to stand up and do this. And... Um, Again, I appreciate you coming on the show today. Thank you. Thanks. Have a great night. You too. Ladies and gentlemen, there she goes. Kim Byzantine. Go check out the website, coldwatercreekfacts.com, coldwatercreekfacts.com. Three short minutes, and I will be right back, and we're going to get into Westlake, and I'm going to give you my take on everything. As I said, the bigger picture, the Rembrandt angle. Stay tuned. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with our number two here on tonight's live edition of Down the Rabbit Hole. I am your host, Popeye, from federaljack.com, popeyeradio.com, and of course, my YouTube archive section, DTRH Radio Archives, Delta Tango Romeo Hotel Radio Archives over on YouTube. So, our number two, I want to discuss Westlake. You heard me talking about Coldwater Creek. It's a separate site. Westlake's a couple miles over from it. Same vicinity. Let, 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 let me be clear about something really quick. Bigger picture here. Five miles, ten miles, does not matter when it comes to radiation. Wind could pick it up. It could get resuspended in the atmosphere in so many different ways. Things can travel. Water. It doesn't matter how, if, if you're five or ten miles away, it's still not far enough. So I know the two situations are separate, but at the same time, they are very much so connected. And they're, they're connected because they're both dump sites. They both have radioactive contaminant from the Manhattan Project, right? What, one case, as you heard Kim talking about, was the, the river, you know, it was by the the mouth of the creek there, and then it fed upwards all this time. With Westlake, it's, a, it's an actual dump site. Now, from what I know about Westlake, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into the details, they don't even really know. I know that there's uh, plutonium and uranium that's in there, but that, there's other stuff that, I, from what I understand, it's pretty much high-level radioactive waste. There's low-level, high-level, you know, like wrenches and stuff that they use to work on the reactors would probably be considered low level compared to the uranium or the plutonium, you know, or the fuel rods and, and things like that would be considered high level. And from what I understand, Westlake was high level. A lot of crap buried there. The government's either not admitting that what was there or they're just saying that we don't know, which I don't know what, which is worse, if you want to know the truth. But if you look at Westlake, that situation, although it's different, it still is connected. Bigger picture. Bigger picture. Step back for a second. Look at the Rembrandt painting from 30 feet away, which if you've ever been to uh, Amsterdam, some of you, if you've ever gotten a chance to go to the Rijksmuseum, you'd understand what I'm talking about. Rembrandt, the painter, his paintings, if you look at them, they're huge. And if you look at them really close, like I said in hour one, you'll see the minutia of the painting and the details, which are amazing, considering what he was working with back then. But if you step back 20 or 30 feet, you take the whole painting into, you know, you, you take it into full context. It sits in your brain differently. You're not focusing on one small part. You see how all the small parts work together to give you that bigger picture. And that's what I'm trying to do tonight. Because although Westlake and Coldwater Creek are two separate incidents, like I said with Kim, it's very much so connected. Two ways, at least that I see it. One, that actually I guess you could say three. One, that again, Manhattan Project 
there's that connection. Two, it's an ongoing thing. Three, there's ongoing government squabbles and you know battles over finances and funding each year, and a lot of that stuff goes on in Congress. And I know governments wait, the government wastes money on things, but I think I would rather have them actually spending money cleaning this up than you know, $600 on a toilet seat. Just saying. This is a better use of their money, but they have to be cleaning it up properly, too. I mean, uh, dumping soil or anything on top of radioactive soil or digging it up and then putting fresh soil down, I think we should be doing more than that. Maybe, maybe move everybody out of there, dig down six inches, and then plant hemp on that fresh soil. Don't put fresh topsoil down. Put hemp. And I mean, plant that stuff close. Let it, let it pull that and let it try to pull the radiation out that way. I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on this. There's, there's people that are out there that are way uh, more qualified to give you a, a better solution. But I'm sure digging down six inches and throwing fresh topsoil down isn't the proper way to do things because it doesn't seem to be working. It, it really doesn't. It doesn't seem to be a proper solution to the problem. Just, just being honest and, you know, just trying to let you know. Facts. So, Westlake. Now, how is Westlake different? Westlake was the dump itself. It was where they actually, the repository of all this nuke waste. So when they dug these pits, you can look at the pictures. There's no lining in the pits. They just threw drums in there and then covered it up. And I don't care what some putts in a suit from the EPA tells you after you've been sitting in, in, in the one EPA, uh, the, the one representative of the EPA his case, what was he wearing a golf t-shirt? I'm referring to the, the Westlake community meeting about a week ago, I think it was. You guys put together a huge meeting trying to get answers. And after boring you all to tears for two hours, they, they, they brought the, or an hour and a half, whatever it was, they, they let the, the, the EPA guy finally got to the meat and potatoes of what, you know, the questions and everything. And it was pretty much, oh, you know, don't worry about blah, 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 you know. Everybody, you know, tr almost trying to make it like everybody's fears were overblown. And then at the end of that meeting, they said that they would get back to them by the end of calendar year and let them know what they're going to do. Now, for the listeners out there that don't know what the problem is, this, this nuke waste repository, right? I was talking about they just threw the stuff in the online pits. Well, radiation does, the, it, the, maybe the EPA doesn't know this. Maybe the EPA representative didn't know this, which is why they should send someone that knows what they're talking about, by the way. Maybe he's never heard of the Wigner effect, but it's pretty much the radiation's effect on materials like steel and concrete and things like that. It's a little bit deeper than that, but for this conversation, that's all we need to, to know. So it breaks down the metal containers that the radioactive material is in, whether or not it's sludge, you know, fuel rods, whatever. Wrenches, tools, metal, anything that's, anything that's been exposed to radiation is now radioactive waste. Anything that's contaminated is radioactive waste. They have to get rid of it somehow. So they, they throw it in these barrels, whatever. It breaks them down. It doesn't matter what kind of container they've used. I think it's called vitrification, if I remember correctly, where they take the waste and they seal it in glass. And then, you know, the glass gets hard because glass is actually a liquid. And the glass gets hard. But it breaks down. It ends up breaking those containers, too. Even that is not radiation proof. So, I, and there's, there's reasons for that. And I don't, I don't want to, I don't need to, you know, sidetrack. The point is, right now, no container they have at all on this planet. And this is not just a problem with Westlake. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the problem with the entire nuke industry in general. They cannot contain the waste that they create during this whole process. Now, why Westlake and Coldwater Creek are a prime example, at least Westlake anyway, and I would say Coldwater Creek because of the leaking and you know the contamination, they're prime examples of, look, they still can't figure out what to do with the waste from 60 and 70 years ago. Think about, let that sink in for a second. I want you to think, think, just let that sink in for a second. They don't know what to do 
with the waste from World War II. And they're still producing new stuff today. How many years have we been going on like this? Three quarters of a century that we've been doing this? Almost making this crap? They still don't have a receptacle to put this in that it won't break down and leak. And they didn't even take that level of precaution at Westlake. They didn't. They threw stuff in just open pits and then buried it with dirt. So that whole area is contaminated. And I'm, I, I would love to actually have somebody on from that area. Anybody out there, any of the activists, I know some of you are listening right now, please contact me on Facebook, Pop I D T R H, Pop I D T R H on Facebook. Friend request me, send me a message. You know, Kim reached out to me at like noon or whenever it was I posted that the first post this morning. She saw it in the Westlake group over on Facebook and she messaged me. And I had her on the same night. And I'll do the same for you. If you want to come on, you want to talk, please reach out to me on Facebook. My email is popidtrh at gmail.com, popidtrh at gmail.com. Reach out to me. I want to get you guys on. If there's more to the story, um, if there's you know deeper levels, like you know, Kim was talking about with Coldwater Creek, there were things that if I had presented it and I knew that, I had a limited scope of understanding of the whole situation. So I had a, a questions for her. And just from letting her talk, she answered most of them right off the bat, actually gave me new ones to ask. So I would love for any of you out there that are, you know, in the, the Westlake area, if you're affected by this, please contact me. I'll have you on. I'll give you the airtime. I mean, that's what we need to do anyway. We all need to come together and work together. All of us. We, as a group, there's more power. Well, I'm willing to give you airtime. I know there's other radio show hosts that will give you guys airtime. You're not alone in this. There's a whole huge world out there of alternative media that will push this. You don't need the mainstream. The mainstream, they might be a roadblock to a certain extent, and they'll never give you the coverage you need. I don't care what you get on. They'll never give you guys the coverage you need. It'll only last a few weeks, and then it's gone because they'll move on to something else, because that's what they do. They're all about ratings and selling commercial ad space. No news media. The, the mainstream, quote-unquote, doesn't care about you. I know that's hard to take, but I'll, I'll get into that anyway in the second half. I want to finish with putting the, uh, the entire situation with Westlake out there, as I see it. So, back to the situation. So now you have this landfill, right? And it's leak. It's it's got all this crap in it that's leaked over the years. So the whole area is contaminated, right? And it's a contaminated radioactive landfill. So that's that's one issue. This, there's three issues going on over at Westlake, as as I see it. And I've talked about this with other activists, and they agree. Problem one: that it's a nuke waste landfill. There shouldn't be any housing within miles of that. The government knows all of this. I mean, to a certain extent, it's got to be about making money and greed. Uh, there's there's deeper levels of reasons why they do things too, but I don't want to digress too much. You'll learn that in your own time. The point is, it, the government is negligent at the, the very least in its duty by allowing these communities to be built that close to these landfills that contain radioactive waste. It's abhorrent. And it's not like, oh, well, maybe they didn't know. No, they knew. They're, at the very least, it's gross negligence. So, there's the first problem. There shouldn't be any housing near that. None. I know some people might not want to hear that, but that's the, that's the plain truth. That's, there isn't any safe level of radiation. I don't care what they tell you. They're lying. They are lying. The EPA is a bunch of liars. I'll say it a thousand times. They're lying to you. The EPA turned off their radiation monitors in multiple places. Like around Hanford, I know there was another place that they did it, I think, out west. Plus, you know, when Fukushima happened a couple of years ago, when that whole nuke plant had three simultaneous meltdowns that are still ongoing four years ago, back in 2011, the EPA turned off their monitors. 
And if they are still monitoring, they're not putting the information out to the general public. They don't care. It's the same EPA that told the ground zero workers and the firefighters after 9-11. They're the same people that told my fellow firefighters that it was okay to breathe the air down there. They told the citizens it was okay to breathe the air down there. Now they know it wasn't. People are dying of cancer. You know, 13, 14 years later, we've lost more firefighters and police to the diseases and illness from breathing in that crap and being exposed to it than we did on the day itself because the EPA lied. So they're not there to protect you, ladies and gentlemen. It's unfortunate. But they're a bunch of liars. Now, does that mean that, oh my God, what do we do? No. You empower yourself. You educate yourself. And there's an entire world of the alternative media out there that you, you don't even realize exists. And you have more power than you realize. You have social media. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. You'd be surprised. Anyway, I digress again. I like to constantly remind people of their, their own true power. I don't like to give out negative information like this without reminding people of, you know, there, ha there is a positive to some of this, and I, I want to remind people of that. I don't want to be too doomy. So, the first problem is, as I said, this nuke waste dump. Second problem is, there's a regular landfill that's next to this community, and that shouldn't be allowed to be right next to a community either. There should be some sort of maybe at least a half mile or a mile radius around that where you don't build houses. Anywhere. It doesn't matter if, oh, well, they, they've got it contained. How do you know what's leaking from under the ground and what's not? You don't know. Oh, they would tell us. No, they wouldn't. I think, I think by now in 2015, we can all understand that corporations will not tell you the truth. I don't care which corporation it is. They're all going to lie about things like that until they're forced to, right? So, I mean, let's just be real. So how do you know it's not leaking? Do they give you a daily report? Do they, do they call you up and say, hey, just to let you know, this week has gone by and this thing hasn't leaked once? No. We actually, we as humans commit a logical fallacy. We appeal to authority. Those guys in white lab coats, they have to know what they're doing or else that company wouldn't hire them. They have to know how to run that facility properly. Unfortunately, they're human just like us, and they make the same mistakes as we do. Think of The Simpsons, the intro to The Simpsons where Homer Simpson works in a nuke power plant, and he brings one of the fuel rods home on his shirt. It like you know, He's playing with it, and it gets caught on his clothing, and he just takes it home. I wonder if Matt Growing was trying to tell us something. Anyway, so... That's the second problem, that there's this massive landfill sitting there, okay? So you, now you have a nuke waste landfill, there, which there should, like I said, there should be like a five-mile radius around, at least. And then you have this other regular landfill. And neither one of them even has like, I mean, the houses are right there. So now you have two landfills. Now here's the third problem. There is an underground fire going on in the regular garbage landfill. And by the way, this regular garbage landfill is its one of these landfills where they, it, they didn't care back in the day what was dumped in it, so Lord knows what kind of crap is buried in there. Probably car batteries amongst other stuff, all sorts of chemicals. And you put all this stuff together in a pile, it starts to have its own reactions. It's like a science experiment. Garbage piles are more of a, a, an ongoing science experiment than people even realize, for real. So now you have this massive garbage pile sitting next to a nuke waste dump, you know, and this garbage dump sitting right next to it, and there's an underground fire. And it's been going on since 2010. And it's slowly making its way closer to the radioactive waste dump. And that's a really bad scenario if it hits that. That's really bad. And I've seen reports, I think the government said it was like a thousand feet, and then there was reports that it was even longer, but there was a lady that posted, and I don't remember her name, so I, I, I can't give her the proper credit, except for the 
18,000 people in that group will know who I'm talking about. I think her name was Claire, uh, if I remember correctly, or something to that effect. But she posted a picture where they measured it, um, and it's it's actually like 777 feet. So thank you to the lady who posted that picture in the Westlake Facebook group. Uh, again, it, that goes to show you that it's even shorter than 1,000 feet. That, that 777 feet. I mean... That's like the size of, you know, some skyscrapers laid on its side. And that's the distance the fire has to burn until it gets to. That, that, that's scary. Until it gets to this waste dump, this nuke waste dump. That's kind of, that's a scary, doomy thing, right? Well, we can hopefully still try to stop this. There should be some sort of barrier just erected. They, they should just go back to where the, the nuke waste, the edge of the dump exists, and then try to go over and start digging. But from what I understand, I think I, I think they've been trying to put the fire out. And every time they dig down to try to put like a fire break in, they keep running into radioactive material because there's, you know, a lot. Again, where did the government dump it? Was it actually dumped in a grid pattern? You know, most most landfills are laid out in like a grid pattern. So they can actually go back and figure out where stuff was buried when. A great example of this, there's a documentary on netflix about atari and in it they they went to go get these atari games from like the 80s and then they were put back in this landfill and this was recently and they were able going back through the records and you know that time period and figuring out what year they would have been buried and everything they went back through the records and they were able to find where these things should have been according to when these guys thought they were buried and they actually found them so these things were laid out in grid patterns to a degree now, how the government laid out Westlake when they threw things in there, I mean, look, they don't like to tell the truth about things. So if they if they didn't care about lining these pits, do you think they really cared about, you know, writing things out on a map and putting things in a, you know, placing things in a certain grid pattern? Probably not. I mean, you know, they were they were stacking. You look at these pictures, they're like, Go to coldwatercreekfacts.com again. Look at the pictures of what they were doing over there. There's pictures of just like the Manhattan Waste, Manhattan Project Waste. And it, it, it like barrels upon barrels, I mean thousands of them, and they're stacked on each other. And I mean these things were just put in unlined pits again. Eventually, Wigner takes effect, breaks down the container. Now this waste is leaking right out into the soil. And again, there's no safe, safe level of radiation the, that the rainwater is not going to make it dissipate. The solution to pollution is not dilution. I mean, it might drive some, maybe the water and the rain over the years drives the radioactive particles further into the ground. Well, that's even worse. Now it's harder to clean up. It's like, it's like the Reagan when it got, when it went over to Japan to help out in Japan after Fukushima. And the radioactive particles on the top of the ship itself on the, the outside of the ship when they were hosing it off and scrubbing it. Although you would think that that, like the action of the rain, would wash it away, right? That's what our minds would think. No, it drives it further in. It does it in metal, too. So we, we need to learn how radiation actually works. We need to understand fully how radiation works. The government's not going to tell you. You're going to have to learn all of this on your own. So those are the three problems. We have about three minutes for the break comes up. Those are the three problems with that whole ongoing Westlake thing as I see them. You have, and they're, they're separate but all together. You have two dumps. One's a regular garbage dump with God knows what's in it. Leaking disgusting chemicals and whatever else into the, the soil around it. And I, I don't care if they say, oh, we, we're, we're getting it all. No, they're not. They're lying. I'm willing to, I'd be willing to bet money that they're lying. So, I mean, they have, didn't they just have a leachate spill at the base of, you know, at the bottom of one of the, the, the garbage piles or whatever? At, or I know it was over there. Um, Infowars had one of their reporters, Leanne McAdoo, over there. I guess she's from the area. And uh, she was there with this lady, Dawn. And um, she's one of the activists getting the information out about Westlake. And there was a leachate spill over there. So, I mean, it's, it's like, there you go, right there. Boom. They can't even contain that. I'm a problem one. And you have the other one, which is a nuke waste dump, shouldn't be even allowed to build housing anywhere near that. And then you have the ongoing fire. 
And then you have the EPA telling them at this meeting a week ago, well, we'll get back to you by end of calendar year and let you know what we're going to do about the fire. I mean, this is this is something that they should be working on right now and worrying about right now. And a lot of it has to do with finances and all this other crap. They're, they're sure quick to give money to other countries for aid, and they're sure quick to uh, to piss money away on bombs and bullets. But they certainly don't want to clean up the mess from that. You know, the government treats the victims of radiation exposure from like the, like the Manhattan Project and all of its bomb testing. It treats all of those victims, if they're not veterans, it treats, it treats all of you like you guys were veterans. You get, that's, that's the same level of respect that veterans get. They deny, we never, we never poisoned you with anything. It's, it's abhorrent, but they, that's how they treat you. They treat all of, you see how we're all connected. They treat everybody the same. They don't care. That's my point. Now, we, we can address this ourselves, but we have to understand the totality of the situation. So we have three ongoing problems. Two of them are those houses should never have built. Those communities should have never been built around those dumps, period. End of story. What they did with Coldwater Creek, absolutely abhorrent. What they've done to all of you is absolutely abhorrent. It's disgusting. But things can be done. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. On the other side, I'm going to get into that light, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about nuke waste. Offer you guys some solutions as I see them. Stay tuned. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back. Final segment tonight. Um, what I'd like to do is if um, any activists out there, again, want to call in, I know I just got a message on Facebook from a lady named Donna, and I, I hope I'm pronouncing her name properly, Clock or cloak i think it's clock and donna by the way is the lady i was mentioning earlier um that made the photo uh, on facebook she she did the uh the the measurement and stuff so i want to give her proper credit for that so thank you for posting that photo and she messaged me and said that dawn was calling uh, actually into the call in lines and wanted to talk so if dawn wants to call in tell uh go ahead tell her to call in the uh the call in lines and i will i will add her because uh, I would love to sit and be able to uh, pick her brain if she wants to talk. So, uh, again, uh, Dawn, if you're listening, or Donna, if you are still tuned in, if you guys could have her call in again, that would be perfect. I got the, the call on lines uh, all set up, so I'll see her pop in on the board, and then I will add her. So uh, I'll just wait for her to call in. So anyway, as I see the the problem, as I laid out before, I... I also, you know, there, there are solutions to some of this. And uh, one of the solutions is, well, the biggest solution is all of you. You, you all need to do, um, you all need to, uh, you need to be the solution to the problem. I know that sounds really hard, especially dealing with radiation, but it's not. Okay, first step, you all need to come together. You need to realize your strength in numbers and that you guys have, power that's that's what you need to realize um, don't expect the media to carry this on for any longer than a few more weeks and then it, it's going to just end up fizzling out unfortunately that's the way it is but it you know it is what it is the, the media is only about making money when it comes to news stories they only care about what's what's hot what they can what they can put out there for a few days and then move on because it's all about selling ad space. And unfortunately, a lot of the ad space is sold to some of the very same companies that are poisoning both us and the environment with things like radioactive waste and chemicals, all part of what Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with that famous speech, correct? Where he warned of the military industrial complex well this is part of that problem so anyway you all have the power you have the strength don't expect the news media to cover this they're going to cover it for a couple more weeks maybe and then 
they'll move on and they'll leave you high and dry just like they do every other activist group, just like they do every other anything, anything that tries to bring any group movement that tries to bring power, uh, you know, truth, tries to speak truth to power, gets shut down by the media within a few weeks. What you need to do is be your own media, social media, YouTube. YouTube. YouTube's like your best friend right now. You stream. Twitter. Facebook. And you need to be active. In fact, Christina Consolo, a.k.a. Ratchik, dropped me uh, a... She dropped me a, a thing earlier, a post that I want to read really quick because she had posted something in Westlake and a lady... Uh, had actually watched the entire video and then she took notes because Christine is trying to encourage everybody in the Westlake community uh, how to organize and everything. And she's had questions from people of how, in fact, a whistleblower uh, even contacted her. And I can't remember, what is it? Uh, the, the name of the, the one company uh, it starts with an M. My brain is shot today. But the, she had a whistleblower from that company call her and, uh, you know, pretty much tell her, you know, I, what do we do? We, we need to, you know, w w give me some advice. How do, we, how do we come together? How can we be more effective? And that actually inspired me to a large degree to talk about this tonight and, and give you this, like, kind of empowerment little brief talk conversation because it's important that everybody realize over there that you guys really are the solutions. I always say at the end of my broadcast, those solutions to our problems are an inside job. Even with radiation, it is. Okay, and some of some people may be affected already because they've been exposed, but you can save future generations and, you know, limit your exposure as well. So anyway, Christina th dropped me this. It's from um, Tara Johnson Douglas. And she, I, they, I guess she either posted this in the group or she posted this as a response to the video that Christine had posted in Westlake. And it's titled Major Points I Learned from My Name is Allegheny County, 1990. And that was the video that Christina um had posted and then she put Dawn and Karen you are you are doing so much of this already thank you and let me check the phone lines and see if Dawn's trying to get okay cool I, I think Dawn's on the line here let me let me go to her and make sure she's here hold on let me I'll interrupt myself because I'm getting messages on Facebook saying that Dawn's on and I want to give her the floor to talk I can always add um, in the archives later that thing that Christina sent me about how to come together, but I want to chat with Dawn. So let me go to the phone lines here. Dawn, are you with me? Oh, you're you're talking to the wrong person. Um, I would hope Dawn would. Uh oh, I, are you there? I lost you. You still there? Sure. Said, no, you know, so Dawn's not on the line. Yes, my my name's not. No, she's not. Okay, but I, my point is, is you all need to look up the history between. To find out who the investors are of Republic, and there, you'd be amazingly surprised. And nobody has brought that issue up. And they're like all billionaires. So I well, that would suggest is actually, you do your homework to find that. That actually is a really good. Pardon me. That actually is a really good point because that's part of the problem. It's this. Well, it's the stockholders, and one of them sold out a big percentage of their shares in June. So I would, I, I would hope that you would look at them, and you really do need to talk to Don. Yes, hopefully well, hopefully you can get Don on the line. Yeah, hopefully she can call back in. Okay, well, thank you for calling in. I appreciate it. So, Don, if you're out there, go ahead and call back in, um, and just just call in. And when you pop on, I'll see you, and you'll hear that that hold music there. And when you pop in, uh, I'll I'll be able to get you back on. So anyway, as I was saying, uh, you are the solution to the problem. You have to educate yourself. In fact, that lady calling in brought up a really good point. The people that are stockholders, if they're billionaires, they're part of this billionaires insiders boys club. Okay. And these are the same people that then own stock in many of the media companies as well. So they're not going to tell you the truth. Remember, this goes back to what I was saying earlier that you're not going to be told the truth. So there you have that. Anyway, people need to come together. I'm going to go back and start reading this thing that Radchick sent me. And then um, what I'll do is 
I will keep my eye on. I'm going to keep my eye over here on the uh, the call-in board, and as soon as I see Dawn pop in on the board, I'm going to interrupt myself and bring her on. So go ahead, Dawn. You can call in. We have about uh, 18 minutes left, and it doesn't matter because I will give you an entire another show by yourself too, if you want it for two hours or an hour. So go ahead and call in. I'm keeping my eye on the phone line. Let me bring up the system here. Okay, so Dawn, can you hear me? Hello, this is Dawn. Hi, Dawn. Welcome to the broadcast. Thank you for coming on um, very last minute and impromptu. And uh, before we even get into it, I'd like to like and extend an invitation to you and any of the other ladies uh, and activists or people that have been affected by this to come on my show as many times as you guys need to to get the information out there and have your voices be heard. So thank you so much for coming on tonight. Oh, thank you for having us. Um, we were trying to get on earlier, and something just wasn't connecting right. It might have been on our end, but we're very grateful that you guys are even um, talking about this because it's a more than we can get in the area where we live. We have a hard time getting media to pick up on this. And it's very frustrating to us because, you know, it, it is it is such a huge story, and it is impacting so many people here. and you know, it's it's really it's really unifying to some extent communities. You know, you have a lot of people who are connected now by the Manhattan Project and by radioactive waste and as heartbreaking as that is, you know, when you get this many people together behind a situation and, and situations such as Coldwater Creek, you know, that's a that that's a lot of people power. You know, we have the ability to get some things changed here. And um it's just really a shame that that's not something that the media is seeing or reporting on. And so we appreciate any opportunity you guys give us to talk about this. Well, we have about 12 and a half minutes left. So I want to give you the floor. You can have the remainder of you know the broadcast tonight. Um, uh, and I'm going to bring you back on so we can get into this more detailed. I'll talk to you. What I'll do is um, I'm going to call you when we get off air. And we can schedule okay. uh, uh, like a good date to have you and whoever else you want to have on. And we'll do a really in-depth show about it. But we have about, about 12 minutes. So go ahead and lay out for the listeners. Uh, I, I, I laid it out, you know, how, how I see the problem as an outsider's perspective. But you're right there on, you know, ground zero in this case. Lay it out for the listeners, the problems, the ongoing problems that you guys are having right now in Westlake. Well, you know, I think the first thing people need to understand is that, you know, from speaking with Kim earlier, yes, there is Manhattan Project waste out in our city. It's in parks. It's in creeks. It's also sitting on the surface of this landfill. However, this waste has been on the surface of Westlake. It has sat there for over 42 years. So it has been up at this landfill longer than it's ever sat in any other location, being source material. So... What's important, you know, and where I disagree with Kim, we do have some off-site contamination at Westlake, and I believe that we are starting to see illnesses. Many of the people that are ill in this area did come from North County, but a lot of them didn't. And statistically, when you look at the 302% increase in brain tumors that we're seeing in um, the zip code around Westlake Landfill, I mean, you can take that and you can say, okay, if 50% of those people, which is high, came from North County and were exposed as children, you still are left with an incredible amount and a significant increase in brain tumors. So we know that there's something here that's also causing that. Um, you know, this whole fire situation has really woken a lot of these people up. I've lived in my house, I'm about two miles south of this site, and a lot of the other moms and families around where I live, you know, they had no idea, first of all, that we even had radioactive waste in St. Louis. It's really one of the best kept secrets here. But also, they had no idea that it was sitting on the surface of a landfill and that that was actually a super fun site. So the fire and the odors, um, they woke a lot of people up to this situation because, as Kim mentioned, you can't smell radiation. You know, you can't see it, and so it's pretty much invisible. But every time people smell the odor, regardless if there's radiation in it or not, they're constantly reminded that there is this invisible sleeping giant sitting on the surface of this landfill. And, you know, for us, 
We, you know, we do. We, we have an underground fire. We just had a surface fire a few weeks ago, a brush fire. And I was standing outside with a couple of reporters while that was going on. And I got to tell you, that might be, that might have been the scariest moment of my life watching that fire because at one point the wind shifted and it began to move west right over to where the radioactive waste just sits on the surface. And, I mean, it, it was just a, a moment of sheer panic for the firefighters. Also, you could see that, um, you know, it was kind of kind of a sign that there really is no safe place for this just to sit out in a community. There are so many things that could happen besides just the current fire that's smoldering under the ground. And I don't know if many of the listeners understand this or not, but one of the interesting and I think complex issues about Westlake Landfill is that the Department of Energy is actually a responsible party at the site. So, the, you know, it's not just Republic Services, it's also the Department of Energy. So your federal government has a say ultimately in what happens with this radioactive waste that's sitting here. And the fact that it's, they're responsible and they've let it sit out for so many years, I mean, it's, it's, that is one of the main things when you hear people in this community that, that they're so angry about, is how, how in the world could the federal government leave radioactive, and why would they leave radioactive waste sitting on the surface for 42 years and first of all, not tell anybody, and second of all, not come up and clean it up. And I think what people are starting to understand, and especially with what's happening with Coldwater Creek, is that, you know, a lot of people think, well, the federal government would never do that. They, you know, they would never do that. That's, you know, that's made up. Then you get to what's happening in Coldwater Creek, and you've got parks and a creek that are contaminated, and there are no signs. So, yes. The federal government would indeed do that, and they are indeed doing that in other places right down the street in our city. So, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a unique situation that's, that's arisen. Um, you know, people are very concerned about the fire hitting the waste, but it goes beyond that. You know, I don't think you'll find too many people, you can just approach a stranger in a store and say, hey, do you think it's a good idea to leave the world's oldest radioactive waste sitting on the surface of a landfill? Do you think that's okay? Do you think, I mean, they're going to look at you and say, absolutely not. I mean, there's any number of things that could happen at that site and affect that and could, you know, wind, rain, let those particles leave the site. So, you know, it's, it's, it's hard, as, as Kim spoke, you know, you want to give people hope. You want to say, hey, you know, we can put an end to this, we can clean up this waste, but the fact that remains that this is not like catching the flu. Once you've been exposed to these particles and this radioactive waste, you carry that within your body for the rest of your life, and it's multi-generational. It's almost like a biblical curse. So for these people to find out that they've already been exposed, I mean, that's a, that's a world-shattering thing to have happen and then to try and get these people to have enough hope so that we can all be in together and force the federal government to come in and clean it up and take care of it, I mean, it's very difficult for those of us who run that Facebook page. And I know you're on it and you're watching. You know, the emotions change every day at this site. And I don't know how, but somehow we've got to come together. Even those of you listening to this right now, you know, Everybody that hears about this situation, I always say this, the, the, the worst thing that can happen is the secrecy around this. And everybody that hears about this, you now leave and you know about it and you have a responsibility. You can either be part of the solution or part of the problem. And the way I see it, the biggest problem we have with Westlake Landfill is not the fire, it's the secrecy. It's getting the word out and getting people to understand that it's real and that this is really occurring in our country. So agreed. People need to be informed first. You, you can't you can't handle the look at it like a cancerous tumor. You can't excise the tumor if you don't know the tumor even exists. So you have to know right. the problem is there. 
Don, we have only about five minutes left. I, I want to give you, uh, again, uh, uh, some more time to talk about this. I, I'll call you off air, and we'll set up uh, another day to have you guys come on. But my, my question is this. Are you guys going to move? Is everybody going to get together and move out of the area or what? Because, I mean, staying in the area, my, my professional opinion, I, I, you know, I'm not a nuke scientist, but uh, as a researcher and m- the opinion of other researchers I know, I wouldn't stay there myself. So, I mean, are people going to start moving? I know that's really hard to do, especially with the economy, and I know it's not an easy thing, but is that even uh, on people's minds or what? I think it is. We've already seen a lot of people pack up and move. We get a lot of people talking. Um, you're going to have to forgive me because it's late at night and I'm going to get a little emotional. But I know Karen and myself have been so busy with the page and trying to inform people that we haven't had much of a chance to sit down with our own families and really talk about the impact to our family and what we're going to do. But i got to tell you, the other night I had a dream and, I mean, it was like we had moved to a different home. And it wasn't big. It was just a small home. And I could, like, look out. There was a field. There were some hills. And my kids were out riding bikes. And I just can't even describe. I, I've, been, I've been doing this for about two and a half years. I'm about two and a half years that I've known about this. And I've, I remember how I felt in the dream watching my kids ride. And I wasn't afraid. And when I woke up, it really hit me. I thought, you know, I forgot what it felt like to be carefree and not have the burden of the Manhattan Project on my back. I forgot. I mean, I forgot what it's like to be able to let your kids go out and ride their bikes and to be able to just sit on the porch and and watch them and relax and, and enjoy it. I I... You know, you don't realize, I think a lot of people don't understand how how much this consumes you on a personal level. So to answer your question, I, I would give anything to feel the way that I felt in that dream. I really would. And it's something that I'm, I'm definitely thinking about with my family. But I have to tell you, um, I'm hearing Kim's story and all the Coldwater Creek and what, how are we supposed to walk away from our homes? and let somebody else move in. I mean, how are we supposed to do that? And because I think that that's sort of what they want us to do. I think they want us to get tired and get worn out and just walk away, and then somebody else moves in who doesn't know, and then they can get away with a couple more decades of just letting this sit out. And, you know, it's It's an ethical dilemma. I mean, I could never sit in front of somebody and hand them the keys to my house and let them bring their kids in my home. I wouldn't want that. What if there's more than just two options of staying or handing the home off? I'm I'm a firm believer um, that there is no such thing as a no-win scenario like that, and I'm a fan of Star Trek, and as Kirk would say, uh, you know, (laughs) no-win scenario is my ass. There is no such thing as the Kobayashi Maru. And um, yeah. honestly, I believe that if we come together and we work together, like you said, Don, we could all figure out a maybe a third option in this case. Maybe get some big attorney in here. Maybe get um, what's her name, Erin Brockovich? Doesn't she have a, a a law firm now? Get them involved. If if you guys could make it an issue, then they couldn't pass those houses on. Then they'd have to address the issue with you. And they wouldn't be able to pawn them off. Maybe they'd have to make it like a super fun site and they'd have to close it off and they'd have to, you know, buy the properties and bulldoze everything. If you can force the sunshine on it, if you can force this stuff to the light, things usually change. Sunlight is the best disinfectant there is. And we need to spread as much sunlight on this as we can. Dawn, we're running out of time. I want to say thank you so much for coming on, uh, you know, and calling in and dealing with you know, uh, the, the tech issues here and coming on and talking tonight. And I'm going to call you as soon as we get off air in a few minutes and I will okay. set up uh, to get you ladies on and whoever else is out there, if you know anybody. Uh, you're, I just want to say thank you to all of you. I want to say thank you to Kim. I want to say thank you to you. And I want to say thank you to Karen and everybody else that's helped out. And you ladies are absolutely amazing. Well, we're, we're doing everything we can, and, you know, to all the listeners, we really need your help. Please, we need you to get on three words, West Lake Landfill. I know you heard Kim, Coldwater Creek, just the facts. 
but we also need you on West Lake Landfill Facebook page. Yes, and go in there, and I urge you to friend request Dawn. Uh, Dawn, do you have an email they can reach out to you really quick if to, to get you on other shows and stuff or interview you? We do. It's westlakemoms at gmail.com. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Email them. Have them on. Dawn, thank you so much for coming on again. I appreciate it. I'll call you again in a few minutes. All right. Bye-bye. This is Sparta! There she goes, ladies and gentlemen. Wow, just a powerful, powerful show. Powerful, powerful show. I like this Anyway, we're almost out of time. 15 seconds left. As I always tell you, the solution to our problems are an inside job. Ladies and gentlemen, I love you all. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. It's you. Don't depend on the government. Catch you all again live next week. I'm out. Ladies and gentlemen, as promised during the live broadcast, I'm adding a few extra minutes of audio here. Christina Consolo, a.k.a. Radchick, had sent me a post that somebody had posted in response to a video that she had posted in the Westlake Landfill Facebook group. And this lady named Tara Johnson Douglas posted, uh, major points I learned from my name is Allegheny County. And that's the, the title of her post. And then she goes on to give Dawn and Karen from, um, the, the Westlake moms credit and thank them. And then she gets into this point by point list of what she learned and what she thinks everybody else could learn. And Christina and I both thought it was uh, very good, very well thought out and very well put together. And we thought that perhaps you all, everybody listening from Westlake, Coldwater Creek and anybody else that's affected by any of these nuclear waste dumps anywhere in the United States or anywhere in the world, this could be a good checklist to start off with for you as to what you could do. So, from Tara Johnson Douglas, major points I learned from my name is Allegheny County. Number one, we need to be knowledgeable, very organized, united, and prepared for whatever is thrown at us, and very peaceful. Number two, we need as many supporters as possible. Number three, involve the media, and that's any type of media, mainstream and alternative, as much as possible. Number four, record and document everything we do. Carry a camera wherever you go, ladies and gentlemen. Number five, get large corporations on your side, especially those that have a stake in the issues. Now, depending on the corporations, my personal opinion of that, mm, a lot of these corporations are in on it. But if you can get somebody on your side that has money, she is correct. Number six, those in authority were saying that it was better for the minority to be subjected to the exposure for the good of the majority. Don't let them make us expendable. That's right. They that That's the answer from the end of the Star Trek movie, the... Wrath of Khan. Spock is inside the 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 engine compartment, or, or he's down in the engine room, and the fuel is. And I forget exactly what it, what it was made out of in the movie, but it was radioactive. And if you went near it, the the fuel for the ship, it would kill you. And he had to go in and fix something to save the whole ship. And he said, "The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few." Now, some people might think, oh, that's that's very noble of Spock to do that. That's very... But if you look beyond the emotional image, there's a message there. And what she just said, number six, those in authority, authority were saying that it was better for the minority to be subjected to the exposure for the good of the majority. Don't let them make us expendable. No one is expendable. All human lives are important. But remember, to the people the people that run things, the powers that shouldn't be, as I call them, they look at us like we're expendable, like we're nothing more than a commodity or a piece of stock 
that they could either trade or do what they want with and then throw away and discard. The ends justify the means to them. Remember that. Number seven, check to see if what is being done is constitutional, and if not, verify and document. Verify and document anyway. Always. Know your rights. Study them. Take the time to educate yourself. Turn off the television and read. Number eight, plan protest marches. Lock arms and stay peaceful. Do not provoke anyone in authority, but stand your ground. Stay silent. Remain calm. Your demeanor is everything in these situations. Make Just Moms STL proud. Know that there is a chance you could be arrested for civil disobedience. Make plans for your family to be taken care of, if you have children, in the event this happens. That's a very, very good piece of advice. Number nine, we need a lawyer. Bingo! You need a very good lawyer. You need a huge law firm. You need someone with some power and some knowledge behind them and some experience to help you and not not someone that's got connections to the very same people that screwed you over either. Do your homework. But yes, number nine, we need a lawyer. Well said. Number ten, don't have any one person in charge. That way no one can target or threaten any one individual. Very decentralized. But you still need to have some sort of organization. Too much decentralization leads to also having uh, your organization infiltrated extremely easily. So there's this fine dance. When I say infiltrated, you'll, you will have, well, you're going up against the, the nuke industry. You will have that. So you, you got to be prepared for that as well. This, you know, it, things are, things are getting real. Ladies and gentlemen, just so everybody knows. Number 11, everyone should remain anonymous. If you are arrested or pressed for your name, everyone should give the same name. They used Allegheny County, hence the name of this documentary. So, there you go. What's your name? Westlake. My name is Westlake Landfill. Everybody come come up with one name that you can all agree on to use. That would be good. Number 12, idea for a sign they had. We are the people, and we say dot, 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 dot. So, we are the people, and we say, and then you put whatever you want in there. Number 13, do a 24-7 surveillance of the landfill with volunteers monitoring what is going on there. Document workers without protection, soil disturbance, animals and birds on site, etc. Videotape or take pictures of everything unusual or in violation. Take pictures of everything anyway because you might not know something's unusual or a violation. Just take pictures and video. You can always go back and look through it. If it's garbage, you can delete the file footage. If it's not garbage, you might have something and you might not even know it. So video and take pictures of everything. Number 14, put signs everywhere to remind people what is happening. That's a good idea. Print up signs and start asking people if you can put them on their front lawn, telling everybody what's going on. Put them up on wheat paste, the old-fashioned way. Put them up on um, telephone poles, things like that with a staple gun. Put them up all over. Staple gun them to trees. Flyer the neighborhood. Do things old school, ladies and gentlemen. It's time to put boots to pavement with this one. Number 15, this is a moral issue. We have an obligation to ourselves, our family, neighbors, and the future generation to stand our ground and demand what is right. Agreed 150%. Well said. You do have to stand your ground. No one is going to save you. You have to save yourselves. We are the solutions to our own problems. Number 16, can we have lobbyists? You're not going to get lobbyists. And lobbyists are scumbags anyway. You'd have to pay them hundreds of thousands of dollars to go talk for you. That's why big corporations have them and the little guys do not. Number 17, if any of the involved parties have a direct or indirect interest in Republic Services or any other organization involved, they cannot be a representative for them. It is illegal. This is a conflict of interest. Good point. Again, doing your homework, know who you're dealing with. Number 18, find all the errors and offenses that Republic Services, the EPA, and anyone involved have made. 
document and be prepared to supply this information. Bingo. And make sure it's documented well, well, well in advance of anything that you plan on doing. Don't try to half-ass this. Make sure you've been doing this for months. Start keeping notes now. See if you can go back and find any footage from before you guys started, you know, organizing and paying attention. This is really important. You guys need to be watching these landfills and any of these sites that the Army Corps of Engineers or the EPA is cleaning up. This is muy importante. Very important. Number 19. The EPA and Republic Services state that the groundwater is not flowing towards the citizens and is no danger to the public because it is not used for drinking water. The sitting commission in Allegheny did the same thing. The opposition said that the amount of radiation would be so polluted in the river that it wouldn't be a danger to the public. So I, I probably, she probably meant so diluted. But uh, yeah, guess what? Radiation, any level, is dangerous. Anybody that says to you, oh, it's just a little bit of radiation, it's not harmful, obviously doesn't understand radiation, period. Period, end of story. No level of radiation is acceptable for your body. It's cumulative, it builds up in your body, and it will kill you. That's the one sure thing about radiation. You keep being exposed to it, it'll kill you. It'll cause problems. It'll mutate your DNA. They know this. They did all these studies back in the 50s, ladies and gentlemen. You should see all the amount of studies that were done, and they know what radiation does to people. So when you have a city council or a city council member or some bureaucrat telling you, oh, the radiation's fine, you're, you're, you don't know what you're talking about. No, you don't know what you're talking about, sir or ma'am. You should do your homework. Because the government's known since they did bomb testing in the late 40s or in the early 50s. They were studying the effects on soldiers. And they learned what the atomic bomb, they learned what radiation, not even the bomb itself, but what the radiation, the fallout, does to humans. They know. They know what can happen to us. They know the effects. But they, it's amazing how much radioactive material is in things around us every day. Anyway, number 20, we should try to enlist people from the EPA or Republic to our side. Um, not going to happen. You can try to enlist them to your side, but it's not going to happen. The government and these corporations do not care about you, and the government is not there to protect you. Number 21, at times they used older adults to lead the protest in roadblocks. They were pillars of the community and had a chain with handcuffs to bind them together. Yes, you need to get everyone in the community including the quote-unquote pillars of the community together to come out and speak out against this stuff. And you have to educate them first. They have to know what they're talking about. Number 22, one elderly lady was arrested. She gave the sheriff an American flag and asked him to deliver it to the governor and then to send it on to the president and said, if you do not have the right to your own environment, then you are not free. Boom! If you do not have the right to your own environment, then you're not free. Very profound statement. Number 23, find out if anyone or any group dragging their feet in this decision is being paid by Republic Services or any organization tied to them. Number 24, verify their meetings about this issue. If they are supposed to be public, make sure they aren't meeting in secret. That happens a lot, by the way the whole secret meeting thing with corporations and government. The sitting commission for Allegheny was caught in a lie when they changed the day of a meeting and one of the members asked if it was changed from Monday and Tuesday to Tuesday and Wednesday. The response was, we only meet once, in all caps, a week. Oops, we're not supposed to be talking about that other meeting we have. Number 25, they could try to file a civil injunction if we start protesting. So we need to document and have as much evidence as possible to present to the courts if necessary. That's why I said you don't want to half-ass things a couple steps back. to so make sure you document everything well in advance of you guys trying to take anything to court or actually start going out in the street. And Make sure you, you have a, a crew that documents, a street action crew that goes out and does protesting. You, you have to have different people do different stuff. 
break it up. Compartmentalization, ladies and gentlemen. You're gonna have to you're gonna have to compartmentalize and break all this stuff up. Although you shouldn't keep the the key to compartmentalization is the powers that shouldn't be use it. Is that uh, each man only knows enough to do his job and nothing more. Here, everybody needs to know everything, but still, you know, be set to your specialty is this. You go out and do street actions. You guys are good PR. You do that in interviews. You do research. You do surveillance on the site, and you have a 24-hour crew do that. It has to be broken up almost like a military operation. You have to think. You have to think the way an investigator would. You have to look at this the way an investigator would. And then finally, number 26, a slogan to say or chant at protests. And protests are not the end-all, be-all. And they will only get you attention for a little bit. They are good. They're good to get out there, and it's good to get attention, but you need to have more teams. Social media, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Anybody has any questions, you can contact me, popeyedtrh at gmail.com, popeyedtrh at gmail.com and I will give you some pointers on how to start YouTube channels and get noticed reach out to the alternative media reach out to different hosts on Truth Frequency Radio the network I'm on if you go to the the host's bios usually there's an email uh, contact email in there and reach out and ask them say hey please can you cover this I'd like to come on your show and talk about this don't be afraid to reach out to people be pushy This is life or death, ladies and gentlemen. This is very important. And I know you all take this seriously. As do I. So, with that being said, I'm going to sign off for the evening. I want to thank you all for listening. Thank you all for taking the time to listen to the extra audio here at the end of the broadcast. And as I always sign off all my shows and tell you all, the solutions to our problems are an inside job, ladies and gentlemen. We are the light at the end of the tunnel. And the people in Westlake and Coldwater Creek and all around that area, right now you guys are discovering your own true power. You're more powerful than you could possibly imagine, ladies and gentlemen. Just remember that. I love you all. I'll see you all again soon. I'm out.